Welcome everybody to Radicalized True Survives. I'm Heidi Sigmund Kuda. Over the weekend, the entire country of Ukraine was bombed while the world looked away. So we are taking you back to the front lines to meet up with war correspondents, Zarina Zabrisky and Paul Conroy. And we also want to remind our viewers a very important lesson from Zarina that this is also a battle for the mind. So our viewers already know you guys. We have Zarina Zabriskie, Paul Conroy with us reporting live from Ukraine, from Kherson. And let's start with Zarina. Can you please give us sort of an update, a status report on the overall situation? Yes. Hi, Heidi. Hi, hi, hi. Um, hello. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we are reporting from Kherson, which is a frontline city in the south of Ukraine. Um, and it has been the frontline city for a very long time, uh, for at least um, since November 11th, 2022. So whatever it is, like almost a year and a half, I would yeah. say. Uh, and uh, just a very brief overview in case you are dusty on your Kherson geography and situation. Uh, the city was the first one. Uh, of the regional centers captured by the Russians at the beginning of the full-scale invasion uh, on the 24th of February 2022. It took them about a week to seize it, uh, not without resistance. And then for nine months, it was occupied. There were a lot of horrifying events, including torture. Uh, and then the Ukrainian army liberated uh, the city of Kherson, pushing the Russian uh, occupying forces to the other side of the Dnipro River, which they are still located since okay. November 2022, which makes it one of the most dangerous zones in Ukraine, as in some places uh, the river could be uh, up to one mile wide only, which allows the Russians to um, attack the city with pretty much anything they have. And this could include um, anything from drones, smaller drones to bigger drones, to artillery, to missiles, um, to chemical weapons, you name it. So it has been incredibly difficult for the people of Kherson to survive. Uh, of 260,000, uh, they're still approximately hard to tell, but they say maybe 60,000 left. Some people are coming back. We'll mention it throughout our talk. It's a crisis situation, especially by the river. Uh, and this week, uh, or the last several weeks, were no different for the city of Kherson and for the Kherson region. It just heavy shelling every day, sometimes every hour at night as well. However, what is different is the situation in Ukraine overall, because in the last, say, three weeks or so, the attacks have intensified, uh, causing uh, the situation close to humanitarian crisis in many cities, uh, starting with the uh, Kharkov, uh, which is a city all the way up east, uh, very close to the border as well, about 40 kilometers uh, to the Russian border. So there Russians can reach the city as well, which they do. And they uh, have been um, attacking it with a lot of missiles and they have successfully took down um, the critical infrastructure objects, many of them uh, leading to complete destruction of the heating system. It will take many years to restore it, according to the mayor. Uh, the city right now is plunged into darkness. Uh, there are no um, uh, like necessary services like water is yeah. not there because it depends on electricity. Communication is down in many cases. And there's a danger of um, another attack, but Paul will talk more at length about the military situation. But uh, before I hand it over to him, I want to mention that other cities uh, have been targeted a lot this last two, three weeks. Uh, two weeks ago, I was visiting in Odessa. Uh, we had drone attacks every night. Uh, the sight out of my window was like some sick firework. The sky covered in red 
dots and moving lines. Um, and you hear the shaky drones buzzing over your head. And since then, um, by day, the Russians have been targeting Odessa with ballistic missiles and cruise missiles. Uh, just yesterday in Odessa, uh, my favorite hair salon, uh, spa and skin salon were damaged badly. Obviously they did not aim for these objects, but they do um, destroy and damage a lot of civilian structures. The same goes for Kiev, uh, where uh, in the middle of residential area, uh, a Sirkon missile uh, destroyed an art institute academy. Uh, and also the cities on the eastern and northern part uh, of the front line, like Sumy and Chernihiv, have been attacked a lot creating this crisis with electricity. And the last thing I'll mention here, um, the situation was very close to the crisis was the um, attack in Zaporizhia on Dnipro um, hydropower station, yeah. which luckily uh, was not completely out of order according to the Ukrainian authorities, uh, but pretty much uh, got close to the worst situation. Plus, the Zaporizhia nuclear power station, which is the largest in Europe, uh, was um, on a complete blackout. Uh, fortunately, the Ukrainian staff was able to restore the electricity. So as you could see, the situation is pretty dire, very critical. And I will hand it over to my colleague, Paul Conroy, for the military overview. Thank you so much, Serena. Before we go to Paul, I'm just going to um, show a clip from you from yesterday where you were basically showing uh, some of the damage as you were walking through the city. So Hi-Fi, cue that up. Walking downtown now uh, to run some errands and uh, shelling started. We had about three explosions so far further away, probably by the river. This is the sound of the incoming shell. The Russians are very, very close to Kherson, just across the river. So there is no time for an air raid to come up. Uh, and um, as a result, uh, you don't know when the explosion will start unlike in kiev say or in odessa when most of the times the air raid siren goes on and people have time to hide in the shelter this morning kiev was under attack and there were parts of debris of a missile falling on the residential area um, there were also hits in Mykolaiv and in Odessa. Every night, every day, there were attacks, including the most massive attack of uh, this full-scale invasion. However, in Kherson, it is happening daily and hourly. Uh, here, residential areas of the city and the region are being hit several times a day, sometimes every hour. There are multiple damages every day. Uh, they're on the average, my estimation would be about 10, approximately 10 people killed weekly. So for those who have not been following Zarina's timeline, that's a typical day and that is just a horror. Paul, let's go to you uh, for a military update. Okay, so, I mean, what we saw, where we left it, really, I think last time we spoke, was it towards the end of the counteroffensive, yes. which was autumn going into winter. Um, the situation on the front lines, the, the Ukrainians really struggled to break through the Russian defences um, ar around Zaporizhia. So you, you got a kind of a big tactical clash there where the Russians couldn't get through the Dragon's Teach, which, which are the, the white triangular um, tank blockers, there were trenches. And they did eventually break through. They pushed into, um, into a salient around Robertine, and the fight in there was fierce. The, no major, major advances either way. 
As you come round, you know, her son, we've discussed it in, on many occasions, the Russians are one mile across the water. They hit it with, with grads, um, one fire, two artillery shells, drones. Pretty much anything in the Russian army is capable of hitting her son. As we move around even further, we kind of get to where we, we heard a lot about back mood last year. The, 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 the huge battle where the, the Ukrainians kind of soaked up a lot of Russian pressure and in doing so took out a lot of the, the Russians' primary VDV forces, the paratroopers, the, the kind of regular good troops w went through the meat grinder in Bakhmut. This year we've seen, a, you, you, you probably heard of a town called Avdivka, and the Russians have really put a lot of effort and a lot of troops into punching through into Avdivka. The situation was made worse, and, and this is one of the main points of the military um, aspect, is ammunition shortages are now really, really having a detrimental effect on the battlefield. In Avdivka, I think it recorded the highest number ever recorded in the war of cab aerial bombs dropped. And that was purely because they did not have the air defences to take down the aircraft that were dropping these 1,500 pounds, incredibly destructive bombs. Um, and the city of Avdivka fell. This may sound, <laughs> the, I think Putin actually mentioned it on TV that they've taken Avdivka. This is a tiny settlement on the Donbass front. It's not like they took Kiev or Odessa or Kharkiv. At one point, I think I saw them saying they'd taken five houses in a village. So it's on a very micro level. But Russian forces building up there, trying to punch through the gap in Avdivka, but are being held up by kind of organized Ukrainian resistance. But again, the ammunition shortage comes into play. I think the Russians are now firing 10 shells for every shell the Ukrainians fight, can fire back. And that is a massive disparity. This is still very much an artillery war. Um, okay. As you move up, you get to Kramatorsk, which is one of the kind of at the industrial heartland of Donbass. Again, that's getting hit more and more by ballistic rockets. It's about 30 miles from the, from the front line. And then from Kramatorsk up to Kupiansk, there are massive Russian buildup of troops on the border. Um, Kupiansk is getting hit by aerial bombs daily. Um, and the fear is the Russians are now preparing for a summer offensive along the Krimina, uh, Kramatorsk, Krimina, Kupiansk line. Then you come to Kharkiv, which as Zarina said, is, is, you know, 40 kilometers from the border. That place, if they fire an S-300 ballistic missile at Kharkiv, it hits before the alarm sounds and and hence we see you know it's still in blackouts how the, the the damage to infrastructure is phenomenal there's also big build-ups of troops along that border um you know nobody knows quite where the russians are going to push in but there is a general consensus that they will make the most of this situation where ukraine is scrabbling for artillery shells and what we're seeing in now in Kiev, and certainly Kiev, Odessa, is the is the airborne rocket attacks now, and I think the Russians are literally just saturating the country with ballistic missiles, with cruise missiles, with Shahid drones, and they know that sooner or later, you know, decisions are, are already being made about what to shoot down, yeah. and that's a bad situation to be. And we we've, we've gone in six months from having umbrellas over Odessa and Kiev and the major cities to now these people in air defense have to prioritize targets. And, and with every mass attack that we've seen to this week, with every mass attack, vital and critical Patriot and Iris T systems are used. And there will come a point unless <laughs> the, the, you know, the American aid package is freed up there will come a point where there are simply no air defense missiles left. And once we, once that point is reached, then cities that were once defended will now be open to air attacks. Um, Europe is, you know, the Czechs have found half a million, 800,000 
artillery shells, which they're starting to trickle in now. But these artillery shells are for one form of battle. They're for holding the front line at Avdivka and, and up in Kharkiv direction. They're no good for stopping drones and and missile attacks. So it's there's, there's two wars going on. There's the air war and the air defense systems, and there's the ground war where these troops desperately need shells. Um, and desperately need the the, the man portable air defense systems to protect the front lines. So it's it's a race against time now. I think you know the the Western alliance really really has to wake up to the fact that that it's now or never. If we don't stop the Russian advances now, in two years we'll be doing the same thing. Only it will be on a Lithuanian, Latvian, Polish border. Who knows? Yes. quite where it's going but that is the danger you know that it's capable of being one now the ukrainians are more than capable of taking the fight to the russians but they cannot do it if they've got one hand tied behind the back which is kind of where we're at at the moment um, um yeah thank you yeah. so much for laying all that out and giving us such an important um sort of framework for us to take back to our viewers and explain the urgency. And Zarina, you were talking about shell hunger versus this delayed aid and what it means and what it looks like. As you guys know, I continually do a deep dive on Mike Johnson. I'm continually doing everything I can to put pressure and expose him as the fraud that he is. And what can we do? Uh, what do you guys recommend we do uh, to push forth aid? We were talking to a uh, our friend Michael McKay um, two days ago saying the West has to wake up to whether or not they want to be, you know, democratic nations anymore. Like, like, you know, what can we do? Well, um, as for the shell hunger, Paul just very beautifully uh, mentioned, explained it. Um, they, I would say they're more than just two wars, the wars on the ground, the wars in the air there it's multifaceted war right as ben hodges the retired general um the lieutenant the commander of nato um troops in europe said uh it, it and the one that concerns me uh the most is the the overall the one that comprises all of these wars and that's definitely what we are Call in hybrid war, and not everybody knows about it. So, what can we do as journalists? We can report, we can shed light on what's going on, and we can help with our analysis for our audiences to make this connection that is not always necessarily clear because sometimes people don't have the framework. Uh, to, as you have mentioned, Heidi, uh, to put it all together, which is natural. You, you know, if you are listening to us somewhere, say, in New Jersey or uh, in Texas, uh, you have other things that you have to deal with. And um, our job as journalists is to uh, bring up um, the severe threat that our uh, country the United States of America, our democracies uh, are experiencing now and are facing to experience further. And that delayed aid package is uh, not the main issue here. It's just one little signal on the way of the uh, system collapsing. So uh, what we can do, I, I really believe in awareness I really believe in delivering uh, these reports to as many people as we can. As you could see, we are bringing you the knowledge from the ground, what we see, uh, what we verify, and it is up to you to take this knowledge and do with it what we still can in democracy namely say call your elected representative write to them and insist on your right as a voter to be listened to because if we don't we find ourselves in Putin's Russia where the voters voices do not have any meanings so that's what I think can be done uh, back to you Heidi and Paul and hi-fi hi-fi thank you Zarina so I, 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 
Go ahead, Paul. Just to add to Zarina's point there, I think that that's critical. The last thing any of us want in 10 years' time is for people to be sitting there saying, oh, I didn't know, you know, that is that is our job, is to bring it out. So people don't have the excuse of saying, oh, I didn't know what was happening. You know, that, that information vacuum needs filling, and that's, you know, that's what me and Zarina try to do on a daily basis. All the journalists are trying to do it all the time, you know, um, because we have to take away that, you know, that is an easy lean to, oh, we didn't know. You know, our job is to make sure you do know. Thank you for that, Paul. High five. So <clears throat> I'm not a terribly bright man, but this That's is what true. I'd like to put together. Putin is Russia. Putin is Russia's military intelligence, Russia's military, and Russia's mob. That mob has spread across Europe and the United States. It has corrupted politicians. It has corrupted institutions. It has joined with other organized crime units. Putin is an octopus. His tentacles reach everywhere. Putin is committing war crimes. He is shelling non-military targets. He's killing civilians. We know that there has been rape. We know that there's been murder. We know that Putin is stealing children from Ukraine. I want to keep it simple. I want to keep it easy to understand. This is all Putin and Europe, but especially the United States of America, who claims to be this big protector of democracy and we're the world police. They are failing miserably, and because of them, more Ukrainian blood will be shed. Does that sound like a pretty simple, straightforward assessment? It does to me. It yeah. pretty much sums it up. Yep. <laughs> Perfect summary. Yeah. No, I, I have no no qualms with that description. One thing to be added here that unfortunately the Russian people at this point were so brainwashed. So it's not just Putin. It's not mm -hmm. only Putin's war, and it's not the Russian people are suppressed and uh well they are. But at this point, they're brainwashed to a zombie condition, and it's a it became a bit more complex than that. What What about the terrorist attack that just recently? I mean, Russia throws this massive attack, bombs Ukraine everywhere, and then we have this ISIS K terrorist attack in Russia. Russia immediately starts blaming Ukraine. And that's all anybody in the Western media is talking about is, oh, there was this ISIS attack in Russia, completely ignoring the fact that Ukraine oh, well, just got... Oh. Two, two, day, two days before, there were two nights on the run before that attack where Ukraine got absolutely hammered from the air. Odessa got hammered. Kiev was hammered. They, they just sent out this overwhelming um, bombardment. By, uh, and that was... That was disappeared from from you know that, that was heartbreaking to see it. That so, was the morning. That was the morning of the attack. So in the morning, by our time it happened, we woke up to this horror happening in every city. Everything you know is going down, and people under rubble. And then in the evening, we are getting the reports of the terrorist attack in Moscow and nobody's mentioning Ukraine. Um, so, and that pretty much shows you again, a part of hybrid war. And I, I don't think that we have time now uh, to discuss or speculate on who did what and uh, who is behind the attack. There could be a separate issue and one certainly needs a lot of time um, and um, attention to follow all the developments there. What is important for us here reporting from Ukraine is at the end of the day, Putin is blaming Ukraine for pretty much anything that happens yeah. and promises revenge. And that's what we need to know here. Thank you so much for that, Serena. I think it's really important that um, we are gonna continue to see horror events, both staged and real. And that it's it's like you wrote to me earlier that you're going to see Putin's new level of aggression 
post-election, post Navalny's murder, and now post the terrorist attack. And that is what I really want to emphasize to our viewers that well, well, the world may look over here or look over there, Putin continues to uh, wage this war of annihilation um, in Ukraine. Yeah, and, and the biggest defense against that is keeping the focus on what's happening in Ukraine, you know, and not Perfect. allowing the narrative to be to drift either side, you know, it's to remain laser like on what happens because, you know, we're seeing we're seeing since the election, since Navalny, we're seeing massive ramp up of events. You know, we were told we were out somewhere yesterday doing a job. And on the way back, we found out that in the last in the last 24 hours that um, the Russians have increased the use of FPV attack drones in our region by up to 40 percent in one day. That is a massive escalation of, of, of attack drones swarming over the civilian areas. So, so you know, that that's real. That's happening. You know, the, the, what happens outside of that? We so, will see, but, you know, it, it, it's keeping the focus, it's keeping the focus very much because a lot, a lot, you know, a lot goes on under the radar. You know, we scream our heads off from over here, um, certainly from her son, because it, it you know, the, the, the idea that her son was liberated in 2022 uh, and that it's a free city is, is a, a complete myth, you know, so we're, we're very much focused on this area. Um, but, you know, all over Ukraine, the, 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 the ramp up is completely visible. You know, we're, we're seeing it everywhere. Yes. I, I, I want to bring up um, the refresher on the hybrid war and propaganda. Yes. You, uh, because we see here the combination of at least three uh, most popular tactics that they use, which is a distraction anything that would distract the global attention from the real issue works for the Kremlin. Number two, it is the gaslighting, when, you know, they turn it around and blame the others projecting on what they are doing. You can always turn it around and see what is actually going on. And third is a rapid fire strategy where all these news are coming at such a close uh, intervals that it's impossible for anyone, even for journalists, to follow up because your mind is oversaturated. Yes. And there's a number of other techniques there. So I would just refer folks to um, Byline Time article on 12 most popular Kremlin propaganda techniques. So if you have it in mind, you could actually uh, take a look and see, oh, that's what they're doing. So this is why I'm being overwhelmed by all these reports and my mind switches off and doesn't want to register things that are happening. That is actually the ultimate goal. That is incredibly beautifully put and that's exactly where I wanted to go. I want you to know that when you did that um, Active Measures 101 tutorial for us, your PowerPoint, thousands of people saw that. On YouTube, we had over a thousand views, which is a lot for our podcast, but on Twitter, we had thousands and thousands. I don't know if it was three, four, five thousand. I don't remember the number, but collectively that and then that was shared through all of our networks. We asked everybody to please share it. So suddenly I am getting an influx of people who are starting to understand what is really happening. Uh, again, we need our leaders to stand up and say what's happening, but we are doing the best we can from the grassroots up. And um, I think we have a moment uh, where people can actually start to understand this. And if there was one or two things you would tell them to really help them as they are trying to frame what's going on around them as it relates to information warfare, what would that be? I feel like we need to sort of seize this moment. Well, I, I think one of the most important things is, is, you know, choose your sources. You know, there are a lot a lot of good journalists out there who are risking their lives, they're working every day to get these, you know, to get these stories out. And they are accurate and they're they well researched. That's the point of what we do. You know, the point of disinformation is to make the water so muddy that people just get tired looking into this muddy pool trying to pull out bits of truth. Right. You know, so pick pick your sources. You know, it's not hard to find reliable sources. Pick them and kind of stick with them and, and work off their recommendations. 
you know, find a clean source and work work outwards from that source. And that way you will get actually well reported, well researched, well analyzed. And and you don't have to go swimming in that pile of that swamp of misinformation where you know nobody in that nobody in that swamp has to prove anything. They just have to throw stuff into the swamp that makes people almost give up. Looking. Yes. People become exhausted and go, I don't know anymore. It happened with Syria. They yeah. absolutely they did this classic muddy the waters. And so till in the end I had people who I knew who knew me, knew knew what I did, were saying, Oh Paul, are the white helmets ISIS? And I'm like and that happened because they it, it was just a deluge, you know. So pick your sources, you know, and you know, don't don't rely as someone one of my favorite radio host says you know don't lie on your anti rely on anti Doris's fake food facebook page for your news you know, she, she probably doesn't know she's probably not there <laughs> yes serena yes i totally agree and uh, i actually get lectures from my american friends and family who tell me on what's happening in kurson in ukraine which <laughs> always perplexes me but what i wanted to tell you it's a very good question what would be one thing the most fundamental thing about propaganda what is the major warning i think my from the top of my head would be um shedding your old preconceived notion of what propaganda is it is not anymore the matter of posters or memes or something that um, you still um, see in World War II propaganda textbooks or classic examples. Uh, it has evolved way beyond it. And it is um, actually what I'm going to say might sound scary. I, I think it is. Um, it messes with your thinking pattern. It changes physically, physiologically, the parts of your brain. This is a science that has been developed for decades by scientists. There's millions and millions of dollars put into the research. Mm -hmm. And, and um, as Surkov, who used to be Putin's aide said, we are not meddling with your elections, we are meddling with your brain. Yeah. And this is the most uh, difficult hard to understand because it's our natural defense mechanism uh, especially in america with our american exceptionalism to think that we are smarter than this look at the russians you know they don't even have uh, evolved weapons you know we, we, they can't possibly be meddling within our brains and that's where our weakness we need to know that it is possible and it's our blind spot that the battle is for the mind and uh, recognizing it is not as easy as it seems. So there is a certain effort here to be made, certain education to be had. And if we don't do it individually, and if we don't do it as a society, uh, we will fall the way the Russian people fell for it because we're all as humans are susceptible. Uh, so, yeah, it's not an easy thing to fin accept. Finland yeah. teach their kids from the age of four and yeah. Russian propaganda techniques. So they grow up educated against because they have a, a rather large border with Russia and they're particularly well prepared for that, that influx of information. So, you know, Zarina's exactly right. It is a mind game. It's it's not no, just... No, I mean, this is so brilliant. And this is why I always ask you guys for that high concept that I can then take back and 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 share with the thousands of people that we're able to reach. The battle is for the mind. And that is so true. And and that is that is um I just I just share with you quickly, uh, as you guys know, um um, we're all human. We all sit here stoically and talk about these horrific fucking events. And we always come together to see each other over the, these horrible events. Right. Um, but we're human. And when your apartment was um, shelled, I, you know, I asked what I could do, but I also 
subsequently curled up in a ball and cried for hours. I'm not going to lie. And then I tell somebody I know why I'm upset. Um, and the response from that person was, well, how many people have died in Ukraine anyway? <laughs> Ouch. That, that's kind of a fucked up response. Sorry. Um, what, what do I, what do I fucking do with that? And what do I say? Yeah. How, well, much, I, how much blood would make you fucking happy? No, I mean, it wasn't Jesus. like, it wasn't like, it, it wasn't, it, it was almost like a cognitive dissonance. Like they could not grasp that I could have, a, you know, friends who are war correspondents who I could possibly lose. And their defense mechanism was, you know, can't be that yeah. bad. Just then as a couple now. Well, I, I mean, it is a defense mechanism, Heidi, just as you said, and that's the way our psyche works to protect our feelings. So I wouldn't even judge this this person um, because it's very clear for me where they come from. It's a, it's very uncomfortable. So our, you know, our mind see, seeks or subconsciousness rather seeks comfort, and that that's yeah. how it forms not necessarily cruelty, but um, we certainly deal with this lack of empathy even here, you know, I'll say something perhaps shocking, but just proving to you that it's a defense mechanism. The other day, I'm speaking to a colleague <laughs> from Odessa and uh, they are being uh, bombarded and shelled, you know, missiles are flying and drones. And I'm saying that, you know, we're discussing Kherson versus Odessa, Kherson has been attacked way more than Odessa, it's a fact, uh, but it's not being reported. And this uh, person, a good friend of mine is saying, uh, well, you know, it's going on every day. There are just, you know, not that many people dying. And it is, mind you, about 10 a week on the average in the region. Yeah. So it's not a big break in use. We kind of understand how it happens. And I, I'm talking about the Ukrainian and a good person and, a, yes. uh, you know, so with empathy. And it, it's it's the, the defense. You know, it's sometimes, sometimes it's the, uh, the, the, the thought or the news we're dealing with is just too big and it could harm you way too much. And then the psyche puts up this defense, which is perceived as a lack of empathy. My, my, my favorite was in the supermarket when we were checking out and we kind of mentioned to the woman behind the till that our apartment had been hit. And she kind of looked up from doing her nails or whatever and went, ha, ah, only once, you know, as, and then she says, oh, mine, mine's been hit twice this week or something. So there's <laughs> levels, you know. That, that like, actually does we, make we it like, so human. <laughs> we've been that that dark like, battlefield yeah. humor. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So, so uh, only one? All right. Oh, we my God. Day. <laughs> but you also reminded me, Paul, that actually I forgot about it, but in Kyrson we have a very good friend. And Max. we have <laughs> mentioned to him that that happened. He said, oh, no, 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 that didn't happen. You, you were not <laughs> kidding. <I was> like, <laughs> yeah. we have videos. We have yeah. pictures. <laughs> I, think, I think you're right when it goes back to the battle for the mind and also the capacity of what people can take in. Hi-Fi, uh, final word, and then I want to know what we can do to help. So you mentioned Syria, Paul. And I think one yep. of the, the, the most egregious things I've seen the United States do in the last few decades uh, was abandon the Kurds, right? Oh. That was just beyond it's the pain. Uh, the the yeah. Kurds stood tight with us. And under Trump, we they walked just away. Fought, they, they fought ISIS tooth and nail on the battlefield. They were the guys on the front line hitting ISIS when 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 it was all in the Rojava region. And then all of a sudden, adios, cut off, you're done. Yeah, feels like we're doing the same thing to Ukraine. And I just, you know, I I I hope that there are Ukrainians there who know that there are Americans who are ashamed. Of well, what's happening beyond ashamed we're doing everything in our power to try to uh force our politicians to do what they need to do as you can see we have the maga QAnon kremlin caucus uh trying to interfere but they are the minority 
and we are applying pressure um, in every way we can, which goes back to what can we do? And is there anything right. that we can do directly to help you guys? I, I think that, uh, look, you know, what you're doing on this, giving us the voice to go and speak to your people and hopefully we'll go out and speak to other people. That is really important. You know, sometimes you feel like you're sitting in her son shouting into a really big, loud, banging void and you're not sure of it's getting out. But, you know, people, you know, really need to make, you know, the only way this works is if these politicians won't act until they really have to. They will look after their interests to the, down to the wire. And it's only when they feel that their position is, is threatened that they will act. So pressure is everything. You know, we can pass it on. You guys pass it on. And people really do, you know, there are very, very limited choices in this in this game and and people pressure is one of them you know yes. it's 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 so important that people do not ap apathy will kill this will kill this country that's what will kill it ap just political apathy okay so so that that's our marching yes so uh lighting a fire to to get rid of the political apathy i love that thank you Serena? Um, yeah, well, uh, like adding to what Paul said, being a little bit more concrete about it, because both Paul and I, uh, apart from being filmmakers at the moment, that's our main um, goal here. We're making a film, but we're also both uh, writers. Paul is a wonderful photographer, um, and there are essays and articles that we produce, and we have an, our wonderful building beloved byline times that are doing an incredible job and I refer everybody to the newspaper to the byline supplement byline radio podcast so we have one solid newspaper who does an incredible job amplifying uh, our reports uh, providing their pages to us whenever we have something to say but one newspaper is not enough uh, yeah. we are writing and speaking to other publications quite a bit but we can do more we're the yeah. only two foreign journalists here so if there's and there's no time to go and look for a publication because we are out in the field yeah. so if there is, is any editor who's listening to me now and you're interested in the live coverage from paul conroy from myself from um from her from ukraine uh, we are here we have materials we would be happy to share that uh, both Fantastic. video reports and articles um, also, the, from the humanitarian point of view, you know, we are involved with people, we have a lot of friends, we are down there by the river, we're talking to people who live in horrid, horrid conditions, and this includes elderly and children, and there's um, a lot of help that needs to be provided to these people. So if anybody wants to help, there are a number of causes. Uh, we don't do fundraisers. We just connect people directly to people in need, not to funds. Uh, there, are, there are families right now. There's a family with a newborn and they had to move back to the area close to Antonievsky Bridge, which is probably the worst area. I mean, wow. we can't areas but it was one of the worst in the whole country uh in terms of danger and they had no means and they had to move back to their bombed house and you know it would be good to help them there are multiple causes anywhere from animal shelters to somebody who wants to help the military people that these causes are there as well they need not necessarily weapons but also um, clothes and sleeping bags and such. So number and number of causes that I can provide a list that anybody wants to donate. Perfect. Every all accounts uh, and it, it people here are very grateful for that and they really need this help. Thank you so much for that. I'm so happy that we were able to help somebody get a phone and a tablet and we can do little mm -hmm. things and we can do big things. And this an interview will help us achieve both of those things. Last thing I want to leave you with, our friend Michael McKay, who's been documenting the war for a decade, uh, wrote his pin tweet is, 10 years after Russian barbarians invaded, Ukrainians remain the only defenders of Western civilization. Other democratic nations still can't decide if a way of life where fellow human beings are treated with decency and respect 
is worth fighting for. And I think we all here believe that it is worth fighting for. And we are going to take this uh, message to our viewers and help them join us in this fight. Well, help as much as you can, folks. Really appreciate it. Really, really to, to be able to get the message out. Serena Zabriskie and Paul Conroy, thank you so much for being with us here today.